Every day, strange things happen across the globe, baffling all those involved. Some such mysteries remain unexplained to this very day, though the key aspect that separates a select few is the existence of either video or audio recordings, capturing either the last known moments of one's placement or events in an eventual cold case, leading both investigators and the public to desperately look for more clues, eventually tying back to the only major clue collected so far. So today, we shall be looking into five unsolved mysteries caught on tape. Emmett Valton At about 8.10 a.m. on April 24, 2011, 69-year-old Emmett Valton entered his condominium complex, located in the area of 2300 North Central Avenue, with an unknown man. Valton and the young man walked side by side, first exiting the doctor's RAV4, then walking from the parking lot into Valton's apartment complex and into the elevator. Two hours later, Valton's guest emerged alone. He took the stairwell back to the parking lot, where he casually stole Valton's vehicle. Police recovered the vehicle three days later, but despite the footage and a clean, bloody footprint lifted from the apartment, Valton's murder remains unsolved. Perhaps the most promising lead in Valton's homicide investigation was delivered by the victim himself. He was conscious when police first arrived and lived long enough to tell officers that he had picked up the suspect at CASS, a homeless shelter in downtown Phoenix. Velton was openly gay, yet somewhat private with his friends about his personal life. Friend Brad Stacy said Velton had never mentioned picking up strangers for romantic encounters, nor could he fathom that that would be a part of Velton's life. Police have no record of Velton using prostitutes. Still, the crime had sexual undertones. Around 45 minutes after the suspect left, Valton emerged from his apartment bleeding from the head and with his pants halfway removed. A neighbor found him lying by the elevator and called police. Valton told investigators that the man had bound his legs and beat him until he was unconscious. He died shortly thereafter at the hospital. Robbery didn't appear to be the motive. There were no known items missing from Velton's apartment, and the suspect ditched the stolen vehicle nearly immediately. Security guards noticed the RAV4 near North 35th Avenue and West Glendale Avenue shortly after the attack. However, police were not notified of it until April 27th. The video provided a passing depiction of the man. He was clean cut, thin and white, and is presumed to be no taller than 5 feet 9. The suspect's face was somewhat obscured by pixels, and he never seemed to face the right angle. But police hoped that some items on him that day would help identify him. The man carried a tan, messenger-style bag, as well as wearing a neon green baseball hat. One lead was eventually brought in for questioning, but police eliminated him after testing his footprints. Valton's home supplied police with plenty of potential physical evidence. Police submitted door handles, an electrical cord, and an empty beer bottle to the crime lab, but results either came back empty or inconclusive. Detectives are now looking to resubmit the beer bottle for more stringent testing. In a recent interview, Phoenix Police Detective Dominic Rostenberg said it's very possible that the suspect wasn't a local, stating, Other than the video, we don't have anything on him. If you have any information regarding this case or any other cold cases, police ask that you contact Silent Witness at 480-948-6377. Seven, seven, or at silentwitness.org. Frantic Area 51 Caller On September 11th, 1997, Coast to Coast AM Radio received a caller who was anything but normal. This man claimed to be an ex-employee of the infamous Area 51, explaining in a frantic manner to Art the host, that he didn't have much time to explain himself. What would follow would surprise both the host himself 
as well as the thousands of listeners. I'm on You're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hi. Um, I, 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 I don't have a whole lot of uh, time. Um, well, look, let's begin yeah. by finding out whether you're using this line properly or not. Uh, Area 51. Yeah, um, that's right. Were you an employee or are you now? Uh, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago. And, and <laughs> I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh, man, I don't know where to start. They're, uh, they're, they're going to... Um, they'll triangulate on this position really, really soon. So um, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone, so give us something quick. Okay, um, um, okay, what, what we're thinking of as, as aliens are, they're, uh, they're, they're extra-dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the, um, space program made contact with, uh, they, they are not what they claim to be. Uh, they have infiltrated a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects of, of, of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. Uh, the, the disasters that are coming, they, the, the military, I'm sorry, the, the government knows about them. And there's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now aren't but they're not doing they're not doing anything they are not they want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable discharge <laughs> The call would be dropped midway through, the satellite and radio station as a whole actually being shut off. Once operational, other listeners and callers would point this out, referring to how the station was redirected as the backup systems kicked in. The most interesting part of this story, however, is that on April 18th, the following year, another caller would claim to be the Area 51 caller explaining that he has called in several times, each playing characters of sorts that he would create. There, anyway, I'm glad uh, you made it back through. Yeah, you got all my paranoia buttons uh, running. I always get very nervous when, when I call you. Uh, I'm Brian, I hung up on you last week. Oh, I see. And uh, I just figured, damn the torpedoes, uh, I'll just do this and let the chips fall where they will. All right. Um, Everybody, I am the Area 51 caller. Um, that's that's my statement, and let you or whatever tear it apart. <laughs> you you claim you're the Area 51. I I am the man. How do you account for the fact, Area 51 caller? Okay. That part of the way through your spiel, the satellite went down. I have no idea, and it scared the heebie-jeebies out of me that night. <laughs> Uh, I've called a number of times on your specialty line nights doing different, you know, kind of wacky characters, and that's all that one was supposed to be. And uh, if the call had been completed, it would have been ancient history by now. Has it, has it occurred to you, as uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard suggested tonight, that perhaps, if you're really what you say you are, you created the reality of the rest of the situation and took down my satellite? That scares the heebie-jeebies out of me because it means that what I was saying was somehow correct and it was fabrication kind of creating um, creating a reality. Yeah, if, if that was the case, I humbly apologize to you because I love your show and the last thing I would ever want to do is not be off the air. air. So what, what, what can I do to prove my claim here? Well... I guess you could, you could, uh, you could give us a little of what you gave us then, so that we could hear it and know it to be you. Are you sure you want me to do that, Art? I'm positive. Um, no, don't, Art, Art, please. Don't. I, I don't want you to ask me to do this. Um, if, if, if I start doing that, that, that guy, I, I, 
<laughs> You're right about that. Now, that, let's just take that little sample that you just gave us so that we don't alter some sort of hard little reality <laughs> okay. here at the end of the program, and we'll let the callers be the judge. Okay. All right? I thank you for this opportunity. This has just been driving me bananas for months. And, you... uh, uh, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know what you wanted me to do. I, I knew it was very difficult for me to prove to you... Um, Hmm. Uh, but I just thank you for, for your, your patience in, in dealing with me up to this time. All right. It's quite all right. Thank you. Uh, Fritz, uh, Fritz in Phoenix, as a matter of fact, called and said, oh, yes, that's him. Somebody else said, oh, no. Now he has done his little Area 51 caller immo, or the real thing, depending on what you think. And so we'll leave it up to all of you. That is what you think. This still does not explain away some of the main questions people have about the original call. Many even pointed out that the second caller's voice sounds slightly different than the original man's. Regardless, the man allegedly confesses that everything he said was completely made up and improvised. Yet, this does not explain away why the satellite was disconnected from the station midway through the call. Many people believe that there is a chance that this man, whether he was originally telling the truth or fabricating an elaborate lie, may have actually been on the right track, speaking just enough truth that the government or some other entity within may have cut the signal altogether to black out any more information from getting out. Jackie Sutton in October 2015, activist and aid worker Jackie Sutton would mysteriously be found dead and alone in a restroom in Istanbul's Ataturk Airport. This discovery being so strange and unexplainable that the story went international, thus causing the Turkish police to undergo an almost immediate investigation surrounding the death. However, the overall conclusion left those close to Sutton to not support their results, stating that nothing about the case made any sense. The investigation ruled that Sutton had simply killed herself in the restroom. Turkish media stated that Sutton had taken her life after growing distressed for missing a flight to Iraq and not having enough money for another ticket. However, the friends of the British activist strongly detest this. Many claim there had to be foul play involved with her death as they only knew Sutton to be a tough individual who spent many years in both Afghanistan and Iraq. However, in June of the same year, Sutton did state her fear of being targeted by IS and has had similarly strange encounters before, having described being detained once by a spy in Intria while she was reporting there in the 1980s and also avoiding being killed in a bombing in Baghdad. Through it all, she continued to love her work and her cause, adding to the disbelief and strange occurrence of her death ruled suicide. Pamela Butler's Disappearance Seven years have passed since Pamela Butler vanished from her northwest D.C. home under suspicious circumstances. Her body has never been found, and there has been no arrest related to the case. Members of her family have come to a sad conclusion that she most likely is dead, with Butler's brother, Derek, stating that he believed that his sister would never disappear on her own believing that someone must have killed her as well. Wanting answers as to why, Derek was actually the one who first discovered the strange disappearance. With the doors of his sister's home being locked, the alarm was off and the house was a mess. This led Derek to believe that foul play was involved with his sister's vanishment. Pam's family would then look through the surveillance system installed in her house after she went missing. She could be seen on tape, entering the house two days before Valentine's Day, and was never seen leaving. The surveillance system showed Pam's ex-boyfriend coming and going from the house at odd hours and for several days. One blind covering the windows was also raised, leaving Pam's brother perplexed as she was not known to raise them as to keep privacy. It is also the only side of the house that was not under video surveillance. Derek suspects that this is how his sister's body was carried out of the house. 
Her ex-boyfriend, who was presumed to be a major suspect, said that they had broken up and he was only removing his belongings from the house. Police did question him several times, but he was never charged. Once more, there has been no arrest connected to the case, and it continues to be unsolved over seven years later. Corona Mall Kidnapping On November 7, 2004, a young woman believed to be in her 20s was captured walking along the sidewalk of the parking lot of the Corona Mall in Corona, California. At one point in the video, a black Toyota Solara pulls up beside her. Upon seeing the vehicle, the woman would set off into a run, only to eventually be run down by the vehicle's occupants, two men, and eventually carried back and stuffed into the trunk. Based on the reaction of the woman in the video, police believe that this woman could have possibly known the men or the car itself. As of now, there are no definitive leads in the case or any solid evidence to even prove that this was a true kidnapping. As the video was rather blurry, the woman and the men have yet to be identified. It is also rather disconcerting and strange that none of the witnesses or bystanders did anything to really stop this, as most merely turned their heads or watched as it went on. Tell me in the comments section, do you have any theories about any of these mysteries? If you find it mysterious, then share and like this video. Also be sure to subscribe, because you really don't want to miss what is coming next. As always, thank you for watching.